You're talking today about the relations between uh, philosophy and its neighbours in the sense of its uh, neighbouring uh, disciplines, so the ones that it's close to. And uh, as you'll see, uh, there are many uh, disciplines that, that philosophy is close to and perhaps uh, even overlaps. Um, so one of several reasons for being interested in this question from a, a more general um, perspective on the methodology and nature of philosophy uh, is to uh, use it to, to think about the question of whether there is progress uh, in philosophy. Because according to, to some people, uh, there is no uh, progress uh, in philosophy. Philosophy does not get better as um, as time goes on. Um, and usually uh, when people people say that, um, they intend it as a complaint or a criticism of philosophy, that it's making no uh, progress. Um, but although it's not always intended in that way, um, I mean, some people compare philosophy to literature, and um, it you know, they, they think that there might be no progress in philosophy in the same way that there's there's no progress in literature. I'm not sure that there's no progress in literature. I think there are my own view is probably there are ups at both up progress and and um, decline uh, in literature. But it it certainly seems that that. The literature written um, 3,000 years ago uh, can still be you know, of the very uh, highest quality, that it's not simply been completely superseded by, by modern literature. But, but in, in the case of philosophy, um, we might hope that it's different, um, because I've been uh, presenting a view of uh, philosophy on which it's uh, similar to other sciences in its aims and methods, and uh, as a result, makes progress in similar ways. Um, and of course, you might you might doubt that. And I, I think one way of uh, c assessing those doubts is by uh, considering areas where philosophy is uh, is very close to uh, other disciplines. Um, and uh, and I think using those areas of uh, where they're um, just uh, on uh, different sides of a, of a border, but uh, uh, close to each other or even overlapping each other, each other. I think uh, we can see that um, it's really extremely implausible to to claim that um, that all those other sciences make progress, but philosophy. Uh, does not when it's so close to them and so similar to to them. Um, I mean, of course, uh, if you were uh, very um, skeptical and pessimistic, you might think that none of these sciences make progress. But I don't think that's a very uh, plausible point of view. I think it's much more plausible that these other sciences make progress, and um, and and therefore we would expect. Uh, that philosophy is making progress uh, because of its similarity uh, to them. So that's that's one kind of argument that I'll be uh, suggesting in uh, in what follows. Um, so so we're going to be looking, as I say, at regions of, of continuity or overlap between philosophy and other sciences, um, and naturally, uh, on the whole these areas will tend to concern the, the more theoretical aspects of the other sciences, rather than, for example, the more experimental or, or da data gathering uh, sites. Um, I, I mean, that's, that's not going to be surprising. Um, and in fact, when you think about some of the, the natural sciences, it, it sometimes seems that the that it may be that the, as we're for, let's say physics, uh, that, that theoretical physics may seem more similar to some parts of philosophy than it is to experimental physics um, in the kind of uh, work that um, 
scientists are doing. Um, and in, in fact, um, when, when you look at, at these areas where there's where one discipline is next to philosophy or overlaps with philosophy, um, it, it, it's not so unusual to find that there are people um, who have very serious uh, training in both philosophy and this other science. I mean, for example, you know, I know people who have um, a, a PhD in uh, philosophy and a PhD in physics or a PhD in philosophy and a PhD in uh, biology. Um, and it's and it's not because they've had some kind of uh, conversion experience and started to hate one side and then do something completely different. It's that's really that's reflected uh, the natural uh, combination of uh, interests uh, or the location of their interests that they that they had uh, all along, or at least some very um, con con kind of continuous development in their their interests. Um, so the the first uh, case that I'm going to talk about is the relation between uh, philosophy and uh, physics, which is is one that that I sort of hear uh, quite a bit about because uh, uh, at at Oxford um, it's possible for the undergraduates uh, to do a course. Uh, I mean, they to do their undergraduate degree in. Uh, in physics and philosophy, and and we have quite a few people who are doing philosophy uh, of physics um, to to teach them, um, and and it's it's a it's it's a very natural uh, combination. We get very good students who want to do this uh, combination, and of course, um, one thing that makes it less surprising is that after all, the, the physics only divert. Oh. There's something wrong in the handout there. It says physics only diverged from physics. It should say physics only diverged from philosophy in the 18th century. Um, something wrong with this, the slide. Um, so, of course, it used to be that what would now be called physics, I mean, you, used to be called uh, natural uh, philosophy. Um, <laughs> so there's a kind of area where um, philosophy of physics pretty much overlaps with highly theoretical physics, where you you have uh, conferences, for example, where, where some of the people present are philosophers of physics and, and some are theoretical physicists. Um, but it may, may be that possibly the... the the biggest difference between those people is just that some of them are in, in a department of philosophy, the philosophers of physics, and some are in, in um, departments of uh, theoretical uh, physics. I mean, the, the, I mean, there are sometimes people, you know, who move from a department of physics to a department of philosophy um, because of the, the kind of uh, interests that they have, but they're, but they're working on the same things uh, all along. Of course, um, these areas where there's a close connection, they they tend to be in, in certain specific areas of um, theoretical physics where it seems that uh, philosophy um, has got something special to to offer or to to learn uh, from the physics, and um, and so they're particularly concerned with. Um, what you might call foundational theories in, in physics, like uh, quantum mechanics and um, special and general uh, relativity. Um, so, th so it's only in certain areas that, that you get this coming together uh, of uh, the philosophers of physics and theoretical physics. But there are crucial areas where that that does uh, happen, um, and and one of the um, obvious uh, areas to to talk about in this connection is um, in discussions of different interpretations of uh, quantum mechanics, um, which of course used to be that the Copenhagen interpretation was the dominant one, but in increasingly 
uh, others are being uh, taken seriously, such as the uh, the many worlds uh, interpretation. Um, and th these these are um, theoretical questions um, on on which the it, the philosophers quite naturally have something to to add. I mean, in the case of the many worlds interpretation, of course, um, there's some similarity uh, between the the many worlds uh interpretations uh, of quantum mechanics and uh the ideas about uh, possible worlds that you get in metaphysicians uh like david lewis i mean they're not they're not completely the same thing for for various uh specific uh reasons but it's certainly the case that that, that philosophers who studied metaphysics have been thinking about issues which are not completely uh, different from, from those uh, that are being talked about by the physicists. And, and similarly, um, the kinds of uh, question that theoretical physicists are concerned with about, let's say, the, uh, in, the interpretation of the probabilities that um, are so important in quantum mechanics, what these probabilities uh, mean, um, th those are questions which have a quite strongly philosophical uh, aspect to them. And so, so the discussions that, that go on, you know, are not totally unlike debates about the nature of uh, probability, but um, where, to what extent they're objective, whether there's an epistemic aspect to them, whether they're, they're, they're connected uh, with something like uh, decision uh, theory. Um, so that, that, that these kind of theoretical uh, questions um are are ones which just uh, as when they naturally have a philosophical aspect to them although um they're also very strongly uh, uh, pressingly raised by the nature of the physics uh, itself um so as w to a certain extent uh, philosophers of physics and physicists are, are, are working on the same general issues. I mean, there may be certain differences in style between them, um, but that's also true amongst the, the philosophers of physics. Some of them are maybe more like um, theoretical physicists and others are more like um, metaphysicians but but there's that's a kind of continuum and i mean there is there's no sort of natural line here that would divide um the the philosophers from the uh, the physicists except for the external institutional uh, line um of whether they happen to be in a philosophy department or in in a uh, a physics uh department um so, so that, as I say, that's that's one area um, where there's there's a, there are very close connections between philosophy and uh, physics, um, and uh, another area um, concerns, as I mentioned, uh, Einstein's special and uh, general relativity, um, and and I think one of the um, the issues that 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 raises um, is uh, questions about our understanding of uh, time and uh, to what extent uh, something like um, a, a more or less commonsensical um, view of time, if if there is one, um, is is consistent with uh, with special relativity. Um, and um, I mean, some philosophers, for example, like um, like pa Hilary Putnam, have have argued that you, that the idea that only the present is real um, has to be abandoned in the light of special relativity, excuse me, <laughs> um, because. Because if there's no pro, because there's no preferred frame of reference, and what counts as the present depends on 
uh, which frame of reference you have. I mean, the, that, that argument has in turn been uh, challenged, but I, I think it's very, it's very clear that um, any properly considered view um, of the philosophy of time has got to take special relativity into account. And uh, it, it, even if in the end it's going to defend some kind of commonsensical ideas about time that you might have had before you knew anything about special relativity, it will still have to do a lot of explaining uh, to, to show that, um, that those commonsensical ideas are, are really uh, consistent um, with special relativity. And I think a little bit more than, than consistent, but that they, they form you know, a, a, a coherent and plausible um, picture combined with relative, special relativity. I mean, it's just, just having arbitrarily saying that there's a preferred frame of reference, but um, what's uh, special about it uh, is nothing that you can understand from the point of view of, of physics that, that would not be um, a terribly plausible uh, view of the philosophy of, of time. So, so that's the second uh, area where um, philosophy and, and physics come together where, um, and, um, and where it's not simply a, a very, a, some kind of special interest of um, philosophers of physics, but, but it is, it's an area where the, the physics um, seems to have important implications for much more general questions in metaphysics about uh, the nature of time and space. Um, so now I'm going to take a, a, a another case, which is um, uh, philosophy and uh, biology. Um, so the, the philosophy of, of biology also overlaps highly theoretical biology in a way that's not so different from the case uh, of, of physics. Um, and again, the, the, the areas of natural overlap will be will just be certain, perhaps some problematic areas in, in theoretical uh, biology. Um, and, um, and one sort of example uh, of, of that um, is uh, the, the theory of uh, evolution. And th there, uh, there are all kinds of issues about what the appropriate units of selection are and how you individuate uh, species, um, which, um, which have a, a strongly um, philosophical uh, aspect to them. And I mean, for example, you know, I, I know a philosopher of uh, biology who, who started out as a, um, just as, as studying uh, biology, and then he got involved in certain theoretical issues uh, about um, the individuation of, uh, of species. And, uh, and he found that the the best things that had been written about these issues in theoretical um, biology had been written um, by a f philosopher, in fact, by uh, Eliot Sober, um, and and so that was what drew him into into philosophy. But he's still retained uh, his his theoretical interest in uh, in biology. So um, I mean, so that's a, a case where the kind of contribution that uh, a philosopher of biology was making was one that was recognizable as a, a significant contribution to theoretical biology from someone coming to it from the bi biology side. It wasn't that, as well, you first of all had to be a philosopher before you could be interested in, in uh, what this person had done. And actually, in, in my own work, uh, although I'm, I, I certainly do not count as a philosopher of biology, but um in in my work on um criteria of uh, identity i was interested in the case of the individuation of uh species um because um what one one of the um uh, 
criteria that has have been proposed uh, for um, when different populations belong to the same species and when they don't is uh, whether the, the the two populations are capable uh, of uh, interbreeding. Um, but the the problem with that criterion is that uh, it it raises um, a, a a logical issue because you can have um, three populations at X, Y, and Z where um, X is capable of interbreeding with Y and Y is capable uh, of interbreeding with Z, but X is not capable of interbreeding with Z in in logical terms. The the, the uh, possible interbreeding relation uh, is is non transitive, and that means that it's uh, you get incoherent results if you try to use it as a necessary and sufficient condition um, for um, the identity of the species to which these different populations uh, belong. Um, and and in some of my early work, I was interested in the problem of what you do when you have a plausible uh, criterion of identity, but uh, it, it's non-transitive, and so it, it, it's actually logically disqualified from uh, being a necessary and sufficient condition for uh, identity. And I was interested in the various kinds of fallback, which where you you have a criterion which is logically satisfactory, but kind of um, is a sort of best approximation in some sense to the original criterion. So, so I, as a philosopher, I got interested in the um, question of the individuation of species, but coming at it from a, a purely um, logical uh, point of view. So that's um, that's how both a biologist could get interested in in, a, in philosophy and a philosopher could get interested in uh, biology because of the the way in which the, there are issues that come up in theoretical uh, biology, which just uh, are in this area of overlap between philosophy and uh, biology. Um, and uh, another area where um, there's uh, overlap between philosophy and biology is in theories of, uh, of biological function. Uh, in other words, for example, when, when we talk about uh, what a, a certain, um, what's the function of a certain um, organ, it, like you know, the function of the, the heart is to, to pump blood or something. And, uh, and of course, it, it's, it, it's an interesting question, what, what the, the significance of, of this talk about function is, because it, it's in some way we seem to be dealing with something it's teleological that has to do with um, a purpose, even though there is no agent whose whose purpose uh, it is. And of course, th there are ways of uh, explaining uh, the the idea of the of the function of, of something, uh, which which don't invoke any kind of mysterious uh, purpose. But um, that uh, again is an area where um, Philosophy and and biology come very close together, where where philosophers and biologists are interested in these uh, ideas of uh, function, and where e each side has something to uh, contribute. I mean, philosophers have um, contributed quite a bit on the the very general notion of of a function. Um, and uh, another e example. Uh, um, of the the close connection between philosophy and biology would would be the the work of uh, Ruth Garrett Millikan, who's wrote a book on language thought and other biological categories, as she uh, put it. And uh, and so there she's um, she's drawing on bio, she, she, biological thinking to understand um, phenomena in um, the philosophy of thought and epistemology and philosophy of, of language. Um, and, you know, once again, when you, when you, you look at um, 
these uh, these areas that that just is no kind of natural boundary where you could say well it's philosophy on one side of this boundary and um and uh biology uh, on the on the other side uh it seems that people from from both sides um are legitimately interested in, in to some extent the, the very same question and the the, the main the main boundary in the area is is just the institutional one between people who are in uh, ph- philosophy departments and people who are in biology departments. Of course, which department you're in is likely to affect you in in some ways because of the people that you spend your time interacting with and so on. And so, in, institutional uh, differences can have all sorts of knock on uh, effects in intellectual uh, culture. But it seems that, as it were the the underlying space of um, questions uh, to be asked is one where where there is not any natural boundary between uh, philosophy and biology, and where there's, there are areas where um, it would be perfectly sensible to describe what's um, being talked about as, as both uh, philosophy philosophy and uh, biology. Um, so, so now um, I'll do another comparison, which is between um, philosophy and uh, psychology, uh, which is again, it's that's a combination of disciplines which um, which m- many students uh, in Oxford have studied for their, their first uh, degree. Um, and, um, you know, it's worth uh, remembering that psychology diverged e- even more recently from um, f- philosophy than, than physics did, really, I guess, only in, in the 19th uh, century. Um, and, you know, my, as maybe I mentioned, my, my first teaching job was at Trinity College Dublin, where I was in a school of mental and moral science. And the, the mental science really had originally been psychology and the moral science was the, the philosophy. Um, so, so that it, it took a long time for those two subjects to uh, separate. And, and given that uh, a lot of philosophy is... Uh, concerned with the mind, and so is psychology. Of course, it's completely unsurprising that they have this very uh, close uh, connection. Um, and you know, and, and when you when you read uh, a philosopher like David Hume, uh, it seems that what he's doing is, is both philosophy and psychology. Um, and of course, of course, the the relevant br- branches that we would now think uh, divide philosophy uh, into that that um, overlap theoretical uh, psychology. They're going to be called philosophy of mind and and philosophical uh, psychology. Um, although there are plenty of other areas of philosophy where, where psychology is in fact uh, very uh, very relevant. Uh, quite in, for example, in in epistemology, uh, I think, in fact, it would often it would be better if epistemologists knew more psychology because often um, they're, they're making assumptions about the mind. Um, for example, about how much uh, in the mind goes on at the the level of consciousness and how much uh, is um, below the level of consciousness. Uh, they're making assumptions about the the role of consciousness, which are not very plausible in the the light of contemporary uh, psychology, without really uh, being aware that they're assuming anything in particular at all. Um, so, you know, an example of the interaction between the the, the two is. Um, a, a famous article written by Noam Chomsky, who's, of course, is um, primarily a linguist, which was a, a critique of B.F. Skinner's behaviorism, which, I mean, Skinner had just published a, uh, a book, this was in the late 50, 1950s, 
uh, called linguistic behavior, which is a, a behaviorist approach uh, to, uh, to language, um, where behaviorism was at that time was the, the, uh, the, the dominant um, school in, uh, in psychology. And, um, and of course, behaviorists claimed that they were take that their focus on behavior was um, the the scientific way to study the the mind, and uh, Chomsky argued very powerfully and influentially that um, in fact the behaviorist approach was extremely unscientific, um, and th- that it, it did not match up to to what uh, the natural sciences. Um, normally did and in in using that um he was he was actually using quite a, a bit of the the philosophy of science uh, of the uh, of the time so there was a, a strongly philosophical aspect uh to to his critique of skinner um but but that that very long review that he wrote in skinner's book is at least conventionally taken as a kind of turning point in the history of uh, psychology, where um, behaviorism um, started to be recognized as a very uh, inadequate uh, way of studying the the mind, and where cognitive psychology that that took uh, the um, mental structures um, seriously um, as something more than just the uh, as were behavioral dispositions or something like that, that that, that was a, where co- such cognitive psychology started to become um, influential again. Uh, of course, behaviorism itself, I mean, had not always been the dominant school in um, psychology, but it had been for, for some decades, at least on a kind of simple version of the history. Um, so so that was, there was, there was a strongly... Um, philosophical aspect to um, to that theoretical uh, turn uh, in psychology, um, and I mean a- another kind of example would be the the work of the philosopher of mind uh, Jerry Fodor, um, where I mean he he, he did work which w- was both strongly influenced by what was going on in psychology, but also to some extent um, influential on what happened in psychology. And um, he, I mean, he, two examples of that, maybe the most important two, are that, uh, his work on the language of thought, the idea that um, a computational theory of mind requires um, that to be some kind of internal language in in which we think maybe something more like a um the, the language of, of that a computer does its internal processing in than than a language in the sense of natural language but but still a, a language and um and then on the modularity of uh, of mind that the the idea that the mind is to some extent divided into um, semi-autonomous um, modules for um, for vision and um, various other mental activities, um, and 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 so the the work that he was doing there. I mean, he's he's a, a philosopher. He he writes like a philosopher, but at the same time, um, what what he's what he's talking about is how the mind and and he's particularly interested in the human mind how it actually works in some way um and um and so it it would be silly to to say that these works of his are not philosophy but it would also be silly to say that they're not psychology i mean they're simply uh in an area of uh theoretical uh, reflection on the mind um, which is of great interest both to uh, philosophers and to psychologists. 
So, uh, you know, I think a very natural classification is that th this is simply an area where philosophy and psychology uh, overlap. And, um, you know, an, an area that I'm uh, at least a little familiar with because, um, because I, it's in fact, um, I've used it in, in thinking about the, the role of reasoning in, uh, in philosophy and in philosophical method um, is you know, debates on the psychology of, um, of reasoning. For example, um, these concern, you know, you know, interpretation of sort of famous experiments by Johnson, Led, and Wasson on, on selection task, um, task where, um, it, which from the beginning were uh, in, interpreted in partly philosophical terms. I mean, for you know about whether it was that that people had some kind of irrational bias in, in favor of. Um, as it were, verification rather than falsification, where that was thought of in, you know, kind of Karl Popper's terms, and um, and where um, the and then some of the the work on interpreting what's going on in those experiments has brought in um, philosophical ideas, for example, from deontic uh, logic about um, the the role of uh, oughts. Uh, um, be, because people are, are talking about various kinds of rule and violation of rules and so on. And, and then just, uh, you know, in, in my uh, own recent um, book, uh, which came out this year, Suppose and Tell, which is on the semantics and heuristics of conditionals, it's, uh, um, I've, I've been using ideas from um, psychology to, to, to think about how it is that we assess conditionals, how we assess statements of the form if X, uh, then, then Y. And um, uh, I mean, there's an aspect of that, that book, uh, which I think it would be quite fair to describe as um, speculative uh, psychology. I'm making hypotheses about what the, the Sort of overall structure of the cognitive processes involved in assessing conditionals typically uh, is, and and so the, I mean th th those are psychological claims that then they're, they're not purely, um, as, well they're certainly not just conceptual claims or anything like that, and um, and I think in the in the long run um, psychological work in this area will show whether that approach is the, is the right one uh, or, or not. But I think it, you know, I'm certainly writing as a, a philosopher, not uh, as somebody uh, who's as we're professionally uh, a psychologist, because I think that the, the c coming at these issues from the standpoint of a philosopher and, and of someone with a particular interest in the logic of uh, conditionals uh, helps one to uh, formulate sort of general hypotheses about the overall structure of the assessment of conditionals, which which might not be so so salient if you were coming at this from a purely psychological point of view, because uh, it's the abstract um, logical and philosophical um, way of thinking about these things which is at a sufficient level of generality to, to be able to, to see what the overall patterns are here or over what, the, what they may be um, in order to, to develop a general hypothesis. And then, of course, all of that has to be implemented in more detail. And um, at some point, uh, all of this can be, sooner or later be um, experimentally tested. But, you know, I think it's important to have uh, some hy hypotheses um, that are properly developed before they're they're, they're tested uh, in an area like this. So again, that's a, I, I would think of uh, that kind of work on conditional thinking as having uh, both a, a philosophical and a psychological side. And uh, relatedly, uh, work that I've done on the, the the cognitive role of the imagination. Um, is 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 clearly, in one respect, a, a kind of 
um, speculative uh, psychology, um, but it, it's also uh, a contribution to epistemology, to uh, to explaining how it is that we can know uh, certain kinds of things by using our uh, imaginations. Um, how, to, how the imagination has a, a cognitive aspect. And, um, and I think it would be it would be ridiculous to 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 worry about exactly you know how to classify these uh, you know as uh, philosophy or psychology as though there had to be a a, very, a clear split between the uh, the two. I mean, some you you can talk about different aspects of it having you know a more philosophical uh, emphasis or a a more um, psychological one, but really you're just talking about whether particular bits of work had to what, uh, how far they're they're similar to certain kind of paradigms of psychology, and how that far they're similar to um, paradigms of philosophy. But there, but there's no there's no underlying um, natural division here between the philosophy and the psychology, except of course for the the division that of the kind that we've seen before, the institutional division between uh, people who who are um, who work in in philosophy departments and people who work in in psychology departments. Um, just some more examples here about the the nature of the um, the overlap. Um, so there are debates on the nature of consciousness, and you know, if you look at the work of, of someone like Ned Block, it, it's just a, a combination of philosophy and psychology. And um, and again, it, it would be—I mean, of course, some of it is kind of quite obviously psychological as we classify things because he's appealing to experiments and so on. But it's it's all in a you know a single argument, um, and it would be to be silly to. To worry about whether to classify that as philosophy or psychology, and and then uh, in the case of the the uh, hypothesis of the extended mind, the the idea that in some sense, um, when we use um, various kinds of you know instruments um, like you know a diary where we keep notes for ourselves, that that in effect is just an extension of our mind in the. the and that it's a relatively unimportant matter whether we um, we use for memory uh, as were well, our own brain or or some external object such as a notebook, and that's that's a hypothesis which was put very clearly and vividly by by in a short article by David Chalmers and Andy Clark. But that's been immensely uh, influential, and it, it's been influential in psychology as well as in uh, philosophy. Um, I mean, in, in many of these cases, you can you can see just how influential these things uh, have have been on the psychology side. Because if you you know if you look up their citation numbers, you where they're getting their citations from, you see that uh, what the influence is. So that, I mean, it's something that can be um, quite easily uh, documented. Um, and um, another area of um, where these two uh, subjects have uh, combined is um, in, um, in in response to the uh, XFI, the experimental philosophy movement, which I was talking about uh, in relation to to thought experiments and the the negative program, which has criticised them, and then subsequent um, work. Um, so this this concerns. Um, joint research by philosophers and um, and psychologists, uh, w where they're investigating, for example, people's uh, judgments about what counts as knowledge and uh, um, what counts as doing something intentionally, um, and th they're doing it by um, testing uh, people's um, verdicts on various hypothetical. Uh, scenarios which are similar to those of uh, thought experiments studied by philosophers. And uh, one aspect of this which is interesting is that whereas in most of the cases that I've been talking about, uh, the 
the overlap between uh, philosophy and uh, psychology has been and the very very theoretical end um, it, in in this tradition of what in a kind of broad sense one can call experimental philosophy um, n- not sp- implying that it's anything to do with the <laughs> the, the negative program um, what we actually have is is a research collaboration in experimental work so it's um, you, you know, now you often have, you know, a, a philosopher and a psychologist, or several philosophers and several psychologists, uh, as we're forming a, a team to to design and carry out experiments um, of this uh, kind, this survey uh, kind, um, to to see how um, how people classify certain cases um, that they're presented with hypothetically. And so, you know, it might be that the philosophers are perhaps are more concerned with the overall design of the experiment and the psychologists are, um, are more concerned with the, the actual implementation uh, of it. But, but they're working as a, a team uh, and they, they're producing joint uh, papers, which... Um, are, are contributions to to psychology, but they're of, of obvious philosophical uh, interest because they're they're showing um, things about how people ordinarily think about certain kinds of uh, example, and you know although I don't think that we, we can do philosophy just on the basis of such experiments. Uh, I think I think it's it's obvious that these um these investigations are, are philosophically as well as psychologically uh, interesting so so that's an example where the 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 sort of overlap between philosophy and uh, psychology can happen at the level of experimentation whereas m- most of the time i've been talking about overlap at the um at the level of um of the- of theory um and now I'll say something about the case of um, philosophy and uh, linguistics, um, because uh, again, this is another area where you find that, um, that well, semantics is a classic case. That that if you look at people who are doing uh, formal semantics as a branch of linguistics, um, then the kind of work that they're doing is very, very close uh, to the kind of work which is being done by by many uh, philosophers uh, of language, and um, and these people they're reading each other's papers, they're going to some of the same conferences, and and so on. And in in fact, um, in this area, um, the a lot of the main theoretical frameworks uh, come from. Uh, philosophy, and then have been um, used by and developed uh, by linguists. Um, and I mean, th- there are a number of um, of linguists who who've played a very key role in, in bringing the, the philosophical work into linguistics I mean, and, and then developing it for linguists' purposes, like Barbara Hall Party, uh, Angelica Kratzer, Irene Heim, and and others, um, and um, uh, so, just a, a, a number of uh, I- examples of this. There's, um, I mean, an early case is Bertrand Russell's theory of uh, definite descriptions, um, which um, he he developed n- not out of any interest in linguistics, but because uh, he. He needed it um, both in order to um, to formalize uh, sort of the la- mathematical language where we talk about um, you know the, the value of a function or something like that using a, a definite description, but but also um, in relation to metaphysical disputes uh, with with people like uh, Meinong, um, but it, but. It, 
in doing that, he produced what is in effect a, a formal semantics for the um, the definite article, which in English would be the, um, and and that has been very uh, influential um, in linguistics. I mean, I, there are not many linguists now who would uh, accept exactly. Um, Russell's uh, account of the semantics of definite descriptions, but um, but there are certainly views out there which are kind of clear descendants of Russell's uh, view, and the and the debate about how the, the semantics of definite descriptions work is one which um, started in philosophy with Russell and then with um, P. F. Strawson's uh, critique of Russell and so on, and which has has now moved partly into uh, linguistics. Um, then uh, another uh, example is um, is Montague uh, Grammar, named after the, the, the philosopher and logician Richard uh, Montague, which is a, a um, started as a kind of application of, of, of a very sophisticated abstract kind of the uh, the early form of semantics for modal logic to to natural languages. Um, and, um, well, I guess one of the, the first linguists to identify this as something that was helpful for their purposes was, was Barbara Hall uh, Partee. Um, and and that's that kind of uh, framework, which as I say, was developed w- within um, really this sort of the semantics of modal uh, logic and with input from other things as well, um, has been extremely influential as a general framework uh, in formal semantics. Um, and, and a lot of formal semantics also uses it, this sort of intentional uh, semantics, as we, we would, might now call it possible world semantics, which was uh, pioneered by Rudolf Carnap and then um, his sort of full power was revealed by um, people like... Um, Saul Kripke, David Lewis, Robert Stolnaker, and so on. And, and so that was, again, something that was originally developed within the philosophy of language, uh, but then applied um, within linguistics. And now um, an, a huge amount of the, the work that's done in, in formal semantics as a branch of linguistics is done within the framework of intentional semantics. Um, and then some other examples is the there's the treatment of indexicals, which is also done within this broadly intentional framework by David Kaplan, um, w- which was showing uh, how to um, how to model um, expressions like demonstratives such as this and that, for example, or I and you now and here and so on, whose reference depends on the context in which they're used, how to model them within the framework of intentional semantics. And um, and then and some of the um, conjectures um, that Kaplan's put forward uh, have been mainly discussed by, by linguists. So, that, I mean, for, Kaplan has a, um, a, a notion of a monster, which is an operator that works in a certain kind of uh, way in relation to um, the indexicality and um, and the question and he had the hypothesis that that natural languages um, don't cont- contain uh, any operators of this kind that there are no monsters as he puts it in natural language and that's been debated I mean I think I guess it may be that that the majority view amongst linguists now is that the, natural languages do contain such operators but but that that's a hypothesis put, put forward by a philosopher of language which has been very very fertile um in linguistics for the investigation of natural languages um the then uh the situation semantics um as developed by john perry and john barwise a philosopher and a logician um which suggesting for certain purposes that we need to uh, replace possible worlds by, as it were, smaller 
little bits of worlds that we can think of we call situations. Um, and again, that's been taken over and has become by linguists such as Kratzer and has become uh, extremely influential in formal uh, semantics. Then there's, uh, for example, discourse representation theory by Hans Kamp, who started out as uh, a logician uh, in philosophy departments, but whose work, uh, which is relevant to things like the um, reference of uh, pronouns and Afro and, and so on, uh, has been widely influential in linguistics. Uh, there's a different tradition um, which goes back to um, to Tarski and Tarski, the kind of formal theory of truth that Tarski developed um, within logic and mainly taken up by philosophers um, uh, as opposed to the, the tradition going back to, to Carnap. But uh, that was um, also used quite influentially by Donald Davidson uh, and his work on uh, adverbs and events, which has been influential on linguists. I guess one of the, the people on the kind of boundaries between linguistics and philosophy of language here was James Higginbotham, who was one of the ones who was um, interested in applying Davidson's work within linguistics and quite influentially. And, and then going back a little bit further, um, there were philosophers such as uh, Peter Geach and Gareth Evans who worked on uh, pronouns um, and the philosopher's interest in pronouns was because of the, the idea that pronouns work something like the bound variables, the X's and Y's in, uh, in first order uh, logic and um, a question of whether, I mean, they do that. I mean, that was a kind of hypothesis Sort of associated with with people like Quine and and uh, and so the, a tradition within philosophy um, emerged of of working uh, on pronouns uh, because of the the, um, the interest that they had in relation to to formal languages. So you'll notice that with a lot of these examples, it's it, it's uh, the philosophical logic that's the the relevant. Uh, part of uh, philosophy, but but all of these show the the, the huge uh, influence that um, that philosophy uh, has had on uh, th that branch of linguistics, um, and uh, another branch of linguistics on which uh, philosophy has been uh, very influential is pragmatics, uh, because again, much of its th overall theoretical orientation comes from. Um, philosophy, and particularly on work done by the Oxford um, linguistic philosophers in the 1950s and 60s, so um, J.L. Austin's work on speech acts, um, Peter Strawson's work on uh, presuppositions, and Paul Grice's work on conversational and conventional implicature. I mean, those are, those are all uh, ideas which philosophers of language came up with and which have produced and pro proved immensely fertile for pragmatics <coughs> as a branch uh, of, of linguistics. Um, and, you know, you, you can see signs of this overlap still in the, in the existence of crossover journals, for example, linguistics and philosophy and mind and language are crossover journals that, that um, are contributed to and read by both philosophers and linguists and uh, joint uh, workshops. And, and an, another uh, kind of border that philosophy has is with economics. Um, so there are, uh, again, there are institutionally, you can see this uh, in the existence of crossover journals such as um, Theory and Decision and uh, Economics and Philosophy, um, and you can also see it in uh, the careers. So um, John, Br John Broom uh, and Ken Benmore are examples of people who started their careers as economists. And uh, th their, the, their interests led them into philosophy. But again, it wasn't that they abandoned the kind of things that they'd been working on in 
uh, economics. But it was just the, the questions that they were asking in economics naturally led them in the direction of uh, philosophy. Um, and, um, and, and one very strong and important area of, of overlap between um, philosophy and economics is in decision theory that um, you know, typically uh, using a formal apparatus with probabilities and uh, utilities and where you're interested in something like um, the expected uh, utility of, uh, of different um, possible actions that you could take. And, uh, and, uh, and so that kind of decision theory is central to discussions of rational action in both uh, philosophy and uh, economics. Um, and again, I mean, you can see philosophers and economists discussing these, these questions uh, together. And, uh, and an area, maybe not so obvious, but um, one that, that I've worked on a lot and so uh, I'm very aware of is um, the area of epistemic and doxastic logic, the logic of uh, knowledge and belief. And the, the key text in the finding of this uh, was by the philosopher, the Finnish philosopher, Jaco Hintika, uh, Knowledge and Belief, published in 1962, which is very much a, a philosopher's book. I mean, he's, he's interested in um, issues about whether if you know, you know that you know, and if you don't know, you know that you don't know, and uh, so on. And, uh, and so he, he's, he's coming at these issues uh, as a philosopher, and he's applying something like the apparatus of modal logic, but with epistemic and doxastic interpretations. Um, but then a lot of the applications of this have been made by economists and later actually by computer scientists. And what, one of the things that they're interested in is that th this um, the kind of formal apparatus that, that Hintika developed um, can be very naturally applied to the analysis of common knowledge where everyone knows that everyone knows that everyone knows that everyone knows something and common common knowledge is is very important in theoretical economics uh because uh when you look at arguments in uh for example game theory which uh, theoretical economists use uh, a lot to to think about fundamental uh issues uh, often there's a, an assumption, it seems, of, of common knowledge uh, in game theory. For example, common knowledge of what the game is, common knowledge of what the, um, the possible outcomes and their utilities are and possible and, and, and common knowledge of the, uh, the, the rationality of the players in the game. So that you're, as we, you're assuming that... that you know that they know that you know that they're rational and, and vice versa. Um, and in fact, um, a lot of the research on epistemic and doxastic logic has been done by theoretical uh, economists. Um, but it was work that could just as, I mean, these were questions that, that could have occurred uh, to philosophical uh, logicians as well. Um, but it, it so happened that the economists were the ones who were more motivated to uh, explore this uh, this area, um, and I mean they th there are some superficial differences in the way that they study it because they they tend to um, think of of it in uh, in, in terms of uh, set theoretical frameworks. Um, rather than the kind of more linguistic frameworks that you get if you think about uh, modal logic. But, um, but those differences are often relatively superficial, and the, the, the actual technical questions are pretty much the same, uh, whether you put them in the way that somebody, a, a philosopher doing epistemic logic would put them, or in the way that um, a, a theoretical economist doing it would put them. And you can recognize that they're the same question. Um, the, there's a, another aspect, a quite different aspect of the uh, the interaction between um, 
philosophy and economics, and in fact, more generally, the interaction between philosophy and the social sciences, which the philosopher Elizabeth Anderson has noted. Um, and that's that the social sciences tend to be done with a kind of value-free ideology. Um, in other words, where it's important to their conception of themselves as social scientists that their research is value-free, that they're not making any... Va- they're not prejudging any questions of value uh, in doing their research. Um, but at the same, ki- at the same time, although they would like to think of themselves as, as scientists uh, and, uh, and they take that to involve do- doing value-free work, um, the, the kind of questions that they're dealing with are often are ones with a very strong um, potential normative aspect because they're talking about the distribution of goods in in society and um, and um, and the social scientists uh, in fact are thinking of some of the uh, these potential outcomes as much better than others and some as much worse um, and as what Anderson pointed out was that that by interacting with uh, philosophers, um, the social scientists can actually talk about the value questions that in fact interest and sometimes motivate them um, in a kind of respectable way because philosophy uh, provides um, a zone in which explicit discussion of value is permitted because we have moral and political uh, philosophy where part of our job is to to talk about these value uh, questions. Um, so, ju- just um, for the sake of completeness, I'll mention a couple of other issues which I'm, I won't mainly talk about here. But in the case of philosophy uh, and history, um, I, I talked about uh, their relation in the previous uh, lecture and. Um, and we saw that, of course, there's the um, there's overlap, but both in relation to the history of philosophy and the philosophy of history, um, and uh, and so so there's, there are strong connections uh, there as well. And then, at, as it were, at, in a very different kind of case um, would be the case of philosophy and mathematics, which I'm very uh, aware of. Again. Uh, teaching at Oxford because uh, we have a, a degree that undergraduates can do in mathematics and philosophy. In fact, that was my undergraduate uh, degree. That's what I studied as an undergraduate. Um, and uh, and again, we, we, it's it's an, a combination that draws many very very able uh, undergraduates. And um, of course, the, the most obvious area of overlap is mathematical uh, logic, um, and and again, the, the, there are the the kind of institutional signs of overlap with crossover journals like the the Journal of uh, Symbolic Logic, the Review of uh, Symbolic Logic, the Journal of Philosophical Logic, and and Korea. So, so um, Hugh Woodin at uh, Harvard and and. Joel David Hampkins at Oxford are examples of people who, whose career was um, initially in mathematics departments doing set theory, but um, but their interests always had a philosophical aspect uh, to them, and and they they both ended, up, or at least for the time being, in in, uh, in philosophy uh, departments, but without without any uh, as a way discontinuity in the kind of research. Uh, that they were doing. It's just that um, because it had a philosophical aspect to it, it was it was natural for them to do it in a philosophy department as as well. Um, and I mean, well, some areas where the the we get this kind of interaction between philosophy and mathematics at the moment are with the status of axioms for set theory. Uh, and in alternative uh, foundations or supposed alternative foundations for mathematics, such as category theory and 
homotopy uh, type theory. Um, so, so those are issues that both philosophers and mathematicians want to, to talk about. And actually, I'll be talking about them in detail in, in my lecture on mathematical philosophy and philosophical mathematics, which is on the 9th of November. And that's commemorating Bertrand Russell's visit in 1920, I think, over to continuing into 21, to, to China and in, in particular, I think, to, to Peking University. Um, so, so that's a kind of survey of the way in which uh, philosophy um, overlaps and inter interacts uh, with all sorts of uh, other disciplines. Um, and I want to spend a little bit of time um, as we're drawing the threads together and seeing whether we, we can uh, discern any, any more general uh, patterns. Um, and of course, one a typical pattern is that other disciplines at some point break away from philosophy and, and become autonomous. It's, that's not the case with all the other disciplines that I've been talking about. I, I don't think it's the case with, well, it's, it's pretty obviously not the case with, with history and it's not the case uh, with, uh, for example, <coughs> linguistics, as far as I know, which seems to have developed somewhat separately from philosophy. But, um, but with many of the disciplines that I talk, was talking about, they, they, um, they originate in uh, a tr an intellectual tradition that was once part of philosophy and then has, has broken uh, away from it. Um, and, and they've become autonomous in the sense that, that, that um, they, as well, they, they're, they're not just considered as uh, subordinate to uh, philosophy. And they're not subordinate. Um, and, you know, and so one kind of view uh, is, that, as it were, when, when a discipline is um, in a kind of somewhat conf confused um, state with, without any very clear methods and so on, it counts as philosophy. And then once it becomes, once it establishes clear methods, and then it, it, it gets to be a, a separate uh, discipline. I, I mean, I think that that's the wrong way of thinking of it. Although it, I mean, it, it's not, it's not completely uh, wrong because of course these other areas did develop their own disciplines. But, but I think in fact um, that it, it's not part of the definition of uh, philosophy that, uh, that it uh, as well has to lack um, rigorous methods as I've been explaining. And, and I think the, the way in which uh, logic it remains a part, or, um, at least in the case of philosophical logic, part of philosophy is a good example of, of that. Um, but also, um, it, it's worth mentioning that the, the, the other disciplines which I've been talking about, um, to the extent to which they're over part of philosophy, they achieved autonomy from it a long time ago. And the kind of connections with philosophy that I've been talking about, they're not, they're not just some kind of anachronistic trace of the past, some kind of, as it were, remains that, that nobody's tidied away, uh, but they're actually a current need. I mean, the, the kind of connections that, that I've been sketching are all ones that developed after the separation, if there was a, uh, if they were ever together, um, so that um, so it's 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 they're not just leftovers from the past. There's something that um, reflect current intellectual needs. Um, and then we might ask uh, what what philosophy contributes uh, to these uh, interactions. Um, so I think there are actually a, a number of different things which which philosophy can contribute, and so we're, we're not always talking about a single type of contribution. Um, 
But I, I think one thing that philosophy often contributes is, is a capacity to identify, articulate, and question very general assumptions underlying a debate. Um, and so you might say that it can think outside the box when it wasn't obvious even that the debate was was in a box. Um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that philosophy is always conscious of all, all, all its own assumptions or anything like that. I think that's... That, that's um, too much to to ask of of any um, discipline, um, but I think I think the very sort of abstract and structural way in which uh, philosophers think uh, and their uh, and in particular that their interest in um, in dialectics and uh, as well as the, the, the rules of argument and, and so on, um, help to uh, enable philosophers to play this kind of, uh, of role. And it's, it's not that it's radically different from, um, from what can happen even by people as it were, in one of these other disciplines who are not in contact with philosophy. I mean, obviously, the, you know, some capacity to identify, articulate and question assumptions um, is present in any kind of reflective discipline. But I think that the, if you like, the kind of skill set um, that philosophers uh, have um, does make them unusually good at at this and um, and uh, uh, unusually uh, as we're comfortable at working in a, a, at a very high level of generality and uh, abstraction, um, and so that they, they've got something to con contribute at this um, level because their their training and skill set is is a, is somewhat different. With a not not that it's as it were. Uh, utterly different in kind but but that that the the emphasis is different and therefore some skills are developed more than in other areas and, and others uh, others less um then there's the the point which i mentioned was made by elizabeth anderson that that philosophy can make considerations of value uh explicit um, and that's that is quite an unusual feature of philosophy. It's, I'm not saying that it's unique, but but most academic disciplines do more or less consciously try to avoid value judgments, whereas it, in moral and political uh, philosophy. Um, of, of a first order kind, value judgments are often what the subject is about, um, and so that that gives philosophers this cap capacity to raise a, a different kind of question that that people in the in its the neighbouring uh, disciplines are often not always but often um, are uh, barred by their own disciplinary norms. Uh, from asking, but uh, as where if someone will do it for them, they may be quite grateful. Um, so, so that's a, a quite different kind of uh, contribution that that philosophy can uh, make. Um, I think an another kind is um, that it can sometimes supply a precise formal framework for theorizing, um, and. And I think that's something that um, analytic philosophy is actually especially good at because it's got this close connection with uh, logic and and its willingness also to use mathematical uh, methods. Um, and and so so some of what we we saw in some of the previous examples was uh, philosophers being able to do that kind of thing. And so. Um, in in the interaction with uh, linguistics, um, it, uh, what the the philosophers of language were supplying was something like a precise formal framework for um, for thinking about the semantics of of languages. 
Um, and uh, and then in the in the the case of um, economics with epistemic logic, um, that's again a precise formal uh, formal framework, um, which which the philosophers are, are supplied. In fact, it's the formal framework of epistemic logic and the formal framework of intentional logic have a, are actually in some respects the same. So. Um, it's it's this is a way in which um as well the the possible world's revolution in philosophy of the the 1960s and 70s um has been exported to a number of of other disciplines um and and that was something that, that as it were developed in philosophy particularly because of philosophy's close connection with uh, with logic, which it's a closer connection um, than uh, economics and linguistics in general uh, have. And so, um, you, you know, even if you might think that in principle there was nothing to stop linguists from making, uh, as we're thinking of these things for themselves, in practice it was much more likely to come from philosophers given the kinds of skills and intellectual connections that they, they have. Um, So, um, as I've mentioned, and as I, th I think these examples show, it, it, it's not the case that philosophy's contributions to other disciplines are all of the same kind. They're, they're, they're diverse. Um, but, I mean, we could say in a very general way that, um, that philosophy's uh, uh, great generality, and, and then a further thing, which is its tolerance of strangeness, give it a flexibility which enables it to interact fruitfully with many other disciplines. Of course, I mean, philosophy is not the only subject that, uh, that is quite tolerant of strangeness. You might think, for, for example, that, that the very fundamental physics is, is tolerant of strangeness. But it, but it is uh, a feature that, that philosophy uh, has, that, it, that, that, as it were, philosophers are on the whole trained not to dismiss uh, ideas as too strange. I mean, I'm not suggesting that we that we always stick to that, but I think that that, that is an aspect of the way in which philosophers operate, um, which um, which enable them to engage with, fruitfully with many other disciplines. Um, a different sort of consideration, which I'll just um, mention. Um, is a, a somewhat unfortunate one, which is that philosophers who work closely with another discipline sometimes come out respecting it more than philosophy. Um, and it might be that it was because they res respected it more than philosophy all along that they wanted to work with it, or it might be that that it was as a result of working with it that they started to respect it um, more than uh, philosophy. Um, so that, for example, you know, sometimes philosophers who have a lot to do with psychology and end up um, somehow having more respect for psychology than philosophy. Uh, it's it's not that it's not that all do, but some do, um, and and you sometimes find that that philosophers uh, imitate and envy role models from that other discipline rather than from philosophy, and that they try to follow its aims and methods. So that, as it were, um, they follow, you, you know, well, just to take the case of philosophers and psychologists, in some cases, but not, not by any means all, uh, the philosophers who have a lot to do with psychology, they they want to, um, they try to, to talk and think like psychologists. Um, now, I mean, it's not that the results from that are never valuable. Um, I mean, sometimes the, the results are in effect that that philosophers who who kind of envy another discipline that they that they're close to that they end up as 
writing something which is more like popularizing the the other science or whatever it is that they envy. But um, um, some, I mean, sometimes it's more than popularization. It's it, it is that they are in effect um, pursuing this kind of uh, theoretical uh, role. Uh, but the, as where they're more like just a very theoretical um, member of the other discipline, and uh, they, they lose a lot of their distinctiveness uh, as uh, philosophers. Um, and, and so this is, it's not always a, a, a bad uh, thing, but um, I think it often involves a, a kind of um, lack of understanding of what the distinctive features of philosophical methodology are. Um, and, and so sometimes you end up um, with the the strange uh, phenomenon of uh, philosophy hating philosophers, um, and uh, and they're uh, a menace. I mean, they're a danger. Um, and I think it, w one thing that happens with with philosophers who go down that path um, is that they they tend to um, abandon the the distinctive skills and intellectual resources of philosophy um, and as a result they actually bring much less to the interdisciplinary table than they than they could um, I remember once hearing A, a talk by uh, a philosopher who had a lot to do with um, psychology, uh, quite a distinguished one, but I won't say who it, it is. And who, 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 and the talk was was to a kind of combined audience of philosophers and psychologists. But but it it was it had a lot of psychological material in it, but um, but was was very lacking in. Uh, philosophical um, rigor and subtlety, and um, and I remember talking with him afterwards, and, and and making some kind of quite ordinary uh, philosophical uh, distinction in you know, objecting to what he had to say, and he, and and he, his reply was, "Oh, I don't make uh, distinctions like that anymore because psychologists tend not to understand them." Um, and it seemed to me that was that was a rather sad uh, reply to to make because it, it wasn't that he had any real uh, objection to the distinction, but but just that um, as where he was he, he he'd given up um, worrying about these these philosophical concerns because the people that he was concerned uh, to impress were the psychologists and. I guess he didn't mind too much if he no longer impressed uh, the philosophers. But it seems to me that it, it's it's exactly those kind of uh, distinctions, which are in in the case I'm talking about, um, were highly relevant to the um, validity, or as it happened, the invalidity of uh, his arguments. Um, the those distinctions are the ones that we can help by by bringing to the discussion. Um, whereas, it, you know, if we turn ourselves just into, well, in this case, as it were, a, a pop psychologist, we're not really going to um, bring much to a discussion with psychologists. So in the end, it's a kind of uh, counterproductive uh, sort of thing to do. And, uh, and so, Part of what I've been trying to do in these lectures um, is to emphasize that um, philosophy is, is not the kind of um, utterly undisciplined, anarchic uh, 
uh, sort of uh, enterprise that we should be ashamed of belonging to, but that in fact it it has uh, its own quite uh, distinctive uh, forms of uh, intellectual uh, discipline. I mean, distinctive as a kind of in the, the, the overall package and the relative emphases, although, I mean, they're all things which you can find outside philosophy. And, you know, and I think um, we, you know, if we understand what we've been doing better, um, we can not only do it even better than that, but we can also see that that we, we as well, we really have nothing to be ashamed of. We've got something to be proud of in the, uh, the kind of methods um, that we're uh, using. Um, and then just to summarize the, the, the kind of argument that I made towards the beginning of the lecture, um, that the philosophy's contiguity or overlap with many progressive disciplines make it plausible that philosophy uh, is uh, progressive too. Um, so where once we've seen the kind of underlying uh, continuity uh, in the landscape, uh, which all these different disciplines are regions uh, of, then the the idea that that philosophy is somehow quite different from all these other ones in in not making progress is utterly uh, implausible. Um, of course, there's still the question: Well, exactly what kind of progress are we making? And and so in the next lecture. Um, we're going to consider an underrecognized form of progress in many sciences. I think it's underrecognized from, as it were, within philosophy, which is also an underrecognized form of progress in philosophy. So, in other words, I think philosophy has been making progress of a kind which is quite similar um, to what you find in other sciences in some respects. Um, but where it it doesn't follow the kind of model that that we tend to have of what progress should look like, and so um, we've been failing to to recognise it, and so see, failing to see the kind of progress um, that is in fact being made in many of this these areas. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to thank um, Professor Williamson um, for all the talks. Um, I have been following them and have learned a lot from them. And I also want to thank um, Chen Bo for inviting me uh, to give comments on this uh, lecture uh, and for the introduction. Uh, now, let me share my uh, my screen. Oh, okay, can you see this? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Um, so uh, mostly I will just read the, <laughs> my comments in this uh, Word document. Uh, uh, so this lecture is about close connections between philosophy and science. Uh, if I understand correctly, Professor Williamson discusses at least three aspects of the connection. First, philosophical problems frequently overlap with scientific problems, and many researchers cross over both sides. Second, philosophical ideas used to inspire fruitful scientific researchers. Third, scientific knowledge is sometimes essential for answering philosophical questions. Uh, besides, if we understand correctly, a major theme in Professor Williamson's previous lectures and other writings is that methodologically, doing philosophy is not essentially from doing science. This lecture appears to focus on content of philosophy and science, and not their methodology, uh, but the idea uh, similar. I personally believe that Professor Williamson has made a very strong case for demonstrating similarities between philosophy and science in most important aspects. And personally, I like very much the idea that I'm just doing a highly theoretical and then perhaps a little speculative kind of science. Uh, so in this 
uh, in the following for raising questions, uh, I want to explore how far we can push this case of similarity to its extreme. Um, I want to ask this question. Are there any strictly philosophical problems, namely problems that only philosophy can fully and adequately address, and science alone can't? Uh, what are those problems, if any, and why do they defy science? Um, well, first consider, say, philosophy of language. Uh, so the question is, is there any problem about language that is so strictly philosophical that only philosophy can adequately answer it and linguistics can't? Um, personally, I cannot think of any such a, a problem. Uh, semantics, uh, pragmatics, for example, are standard linguistic research topics. And any adequate theory about them should be based on observing linguistic data and building models to fit those data. Uh, philosophers certainly can do that. Um, uh, but we can consider it a piece of work in linguistics. And uh, that is, it's not, say, uh, exclusively philosophical or uh, uh, not, you know, uh, completely special, uh, but philosophical. Now, uh, other problems about language look similar. Uh, some might suggest that uh, theory of truth is strictly philosophical because it concerns a connection between the inner mental world and the external world. Uh, however, some philosophers believe that truth can be naturalized. Um, a naturalistic characterization of truth will look like a theory in cognitive science. They will postulate a human cognitive architecture, postulate how concepts and thoughts are realized in the human cognitive architecture, and then propose a model about how concepts and thoughts are connected to things in human environments. Uh, which are then considered the relations, conceptual representation, and truth. One can then test the model against the observational data, that is, against our intuitive observations about how various concepts and thoughts represent things and states of our environments. Such a theory will be a standard cognitive scientific theory. Now, some philosophers might deny the possibility of naturalizing truth. So uh, my next question is, is the idea that there are strictly philosophical problems tied to the assumption that some aspects of the mind somehow defy all scientific investigations, including all cognitive scientific modeling attempts? What exactly are what exactly can make an aspect of the mind elude to all potential cognitive scientific modeling? A similar comment can be made about epistemology. Uh, Quine uh, used to say that epistemology should be a branch of psychology, and an, ob an, an objection claims that epistemology should be a normative theory, uh, while psychology is merely descriptive. Uh, however, some philosophers believe that you can explain normativity in terms of evolution and biological functions, uh, more specifically, the biological purpose of human cognitive mechanisms is for achieving truth. Uh, therefore, if truth is naturalized, then epistemic value virtues of a cognitive mechanism should be naturalistic properties as well. Namely, qualities that can allow the mechanism, the cognitive mechanism to achieve more truth or to achieve truth in some better ways. Uh, this means that epistemology will become a branch of cognitive science for evaluating various human cognitive mechanisms for the purpose of achieving truths. Uh, it will perform such evaluations based on postulating a human cognitive architecture, 
and postulating how cognitive mechanisms are realized on such a cognitive architecture. It again appears that if one claims that epistemology is strictly philosophical, then one must be assuming that something about the mind related to epistemology will elude all potential cognitive scientific modeling. Now, there are things in the mind for which we seem to have strong intuitive reasons to think to be beyond all scientific modeling. They are the so-called phenomenal characters or what it is likeness of our phenomenal experiences. However, if that is all that can defy science, it is not very much. When philosophers traditionally study truth, knowledge, ethics, or philosophy of mathematics, and so on, they are never interested in our phenomenal characters of our phenomenal experiences of achieving truth, knowing things, doing good or evil, or proving mathematical theorems. For instance, we are interested in what justifies our acceptance of a mathematical axiom. Why would one be interested in one's phenomenal characters or one's phenomenal experiences of accepting the axiom? So even if we admit that these irreducibly subjective, private, and first personal things defy all scientific modeling, it probably will not save an interesting part of traditional philosophy from being taken over by science. So let me repeat the last question in another format. Is it true that all legitimate non-scientific investigations are just our introspective examinations of our own private subjective phenomenal characters of our own feelings and all other legitimate investigations are essentially scientific investigations. If that is true, then should we just admit that we philosophers are just doing science? So probably the highly theoretical and a little speculative part of science. Uh, if that's not true, then what exactly are the other aspects of a mind? Um, I mean, aspects other than one's subjective phenomenal characters of one's feelings that can resist all cognitive scientific modeling and at the same time are relevant to true knowledge, justification, uh, and so on. They mean relevant to what traditionally interests us in philosophy. And second, next question is why can scientific modeling fully treat these aspects of the mind? Um, well, that's my <laughs> comments and questions. Thank you, Professor Williams. It's a wonderful talk. Yeah, I have three questions. So, okay. Uh, uh, my questions concern uh, interdisciplinary research and the value of philosophy. Uh, sorry. So my first, uh, my first question is how to understand the relation between philosophy and other disciplines? This is a series of questions. Second, can cognitive science be helpful to metaphysics? The third is what can scholars from some disciplines uh, for example, psychology, then from philosophy, uh, philosophy of mind. Yeah. Uh, let me explain the first question. Uh, there are two kinds of relations. R1, the relationship between philosophy and other disciplines. For example, philosophy of mind and psychology, linguistics and the philosophy of language, biology and the philosophy of biology. Uh, so there is R1 interdisciplinary research. Uh, exper experimental philosophy is the intersection between psychology and the philosophy. Uh, moral psychology is the intersection research between ethics and the psychology. Uh, this is R1 relation. R2 relation. This is the relationship among other disciplines. For example, 
psychology and uh, linguistics, biology and uh, economics, uh, R1 interdisciplinary research. Uh, for example, behavior economics is the intersection research between psychology and uh, economics. So uh, how to understand R1 and R2? On the one hand, we intuitively feel that R1 and R2 are different. There is a philosophy of X, but there is seem to be low, for example, biology of X. Behind this intuition, reveal that philosophy is different from other disciplines. Someone may think that philosophy is above all the other disciplines, and it becomes the foundation of other disciplines. In particular, to emphasize this distinction, some hold the position philosophy is the study of concepts, while science is the study with facts, emphasizing the dis distinction between philosophy and science. On the other hand, Quine uh, said that philosophy and science are continuous, and there is no essential difference between them. Philosophy is a stage of science, and even claims that philosophy is a philosophy of science enough. So how to understand R1 and R2? Are they the same? Or different. Uh, Prof Professor Williamson said, philosophy of mind is not the only branch of philosophy that, that learns what should learn from psychology. I agree with this point. Leave aside the negative program of experimental criticism on intuition. Actually, experimental philosophy is a branch that learns from psychology. Joshua Loeb claims that experimental philosophy is a cognitive science. So, how to understand the interdisciplinary research of philosophy and other fields? What are the differences between the two kinds of uh, interdisciplinary research? Furthermore, how to locate the rule of empirical method and the conceptualized method in philosophy and science? This is my first question. Uh, my second question is, can cognitive science be helpful to metaphysics? Uh, Professor Williamson put forward two dimensions on a study of time, <laughs> physical and metaphysical study of time. And I agree with you that in a study of metaphysics, the basic theory of physics should not be in the law. But we also need psychological research on time. This part of research is written to human perception, but not close, closely related to physical theory. The, Leo cognitive metaphysics is actually to understood, understand metaphysics from cognitive science, such as causality, time, and individuation. Uh, in this kind of study, it seems that uh, theory of relativity does not need to be mentioned. So my question is, can cognitive science be helpful to metaphysics? Uh, furthermore, uh, there's a paper uh, Evan Goodman uh, read. He wants to uh, bridge the metaphysics and, and the cognitive science. Uh, in this abstract, he, he claimed, concerning the problem of in event indiv individuation, there exist many two points of video, the unifier video and the multiplier video, where the evidence given by cognitive science manifests as the two groups of petition in a debate are theorizing about the reference of two different types of mental representation, which would abandon the original assumption of both videos, that exactly one of the videos is right. Instead, we should conclude that both are right. The best solution is to countenance two metaphysical categories of events. This is how cognitive science can play a role in metaphysics. So my additional question is, can cognitive science be more helpful to metaphysics rather than physics? Last question. Uh, in this speech, uh, Professor Williamson made a talk about how philosophers learn from other science, in method, theories, conclusions, and how scholars from some disciplines, such as linguistics, economics, learn from philosophy. Uh, philosophy language and uh, epistemic logic. I want to ask uh, specific questions. In the field of consciousness re research or artificial intelligence research, research, can philosophy do any two truly effective solution to, the, to this 
essential products. That's all. Thank you. Thank you both for your your questions. Um, I'll I'll go through and and answer as as many of them as I can. Um, so I th I think one issue that needs to be clarified between Ye Fong and and me was the question of what exactly what we mean by by science um because sometimes he was he was using philosophy to to mean something that's that's different from science but then he was also at the end saying maybe philosophy just is science but i think as I understood him, a lot of the time when he was talking about science, what he he specifically had in mind was natural science, um, and and I, in my view, philosophy is part of science, but it's not part of natural science. And and I think of the I mean the, an e easier example to show the difference between science and natural science is that I take it that mathematics is a science but not uh, a natural science, whereas physics, biology, chemistry, and so on they're all natural uh, sciences. Um, and and so I, I think, but I think a lot of the time when he was talking about science, he, he what he had in mind, as far as I could see, was natural science. So the first um, of his questions was about whether there are any strictly philosophical problems um, with, and these were meant to be questions for, that philosophy might answer but that science alone can't answer um, and of course if on, on my understanding if philosophy can answer them then of course science can answer them because philosophy is part of science but if, if we're talking about natural science um, I I think that um, yes, that, that there are um, questions in um, in philosophy which which natural uh, science can't answer because um, th th there are questions. Well, for example, questions in philosophical logic are ones which natural science is is, is not. Um, is not suitable for answering, and and another one in in metaphysics um, was uh, the the question of physicalism. I mean, roughly speaking, whether um, the the only objects and properties and relations that there are are physical objects, properties and relations, and and i don't i don't think that that natural science is an appropriate um, discipline or group of disciplines for answering uh, the the question of physicalism um simply because its its concern is just with the physical world and um, and so it's not in a good position to to ask whether the, whether there are other things that it's it's not concerned with. Um, and I, I think if we if we handed over the question of physicalism to the physical um, sciences, um, we, we might just we you know we'd be liable to get a very biased answer. I mean, probably the answer yes, but but um, I, I think we need something that's a little bit um less committed to one side and I and I think philosophy is in a better um position to to do that than than any natural uh, science to to assess the question of physicalism um then there was the there was a question of whether um for example concerning language there are any distinctively uh philosophical questions um so i mean i think that the 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 kind of um theories that 
that I was mentioning in semantics um, are are not really ones that that natural science was very well equipped to come up with because they were these were theories that uh, I mean for example the intentional framework which the possible worlds framework for semantics um, which um, is although I mean. Maybe somebody in cognitive science could come up with that, but it seems when you think about how how it emerged um, from the philosophical tradition in terms of consideration of modal logic and so on, I think philosophy was much more likely, uh, um, uh, much better able to come up with the uh, intentional frameworks than than a, a more naturalistic uh, approach. And uh, an, another type of question about language which, uh, and the naturalistic approach might not be well equipped to answer, is about um, what are um, necessary conditions for being a language? Um, Because the the naturalistic approach is mainly focused on human language, but um, there's nothing necessary about the idea that all language has to be human. I mean, there, you know, there's nothing to stop intelligent uh, aliens from other galaxies having languages which are rather different from human languages. And and I think the, the greater kind of generality of uh, philosophy is uh, in some way it may, makes it better equipped than a more naturalistic approach to uh, to consider questions about what is strictly necessary. Uh, for um, for being a, a language, um, th- and then the, uh, another issue that that was mentioned was the the question of truth, um, and um, and the suggestion was that that really something like uh, cognitive science would be the best um, science for producing a, a good theory of truth, um, but. I mean, the, the notion of truth uh, is, it's a quasi-logical I- idea. I, I, th- I think the, the fundamental aspect of truth was already articulated by um, Aristotle when, when he said that, that uh, to say of what is that it is, or of what is not that it is not, is tr- true, and to say of what is that it is not, or of what is not that it is, is false. I mean, that, I think that's, that already captures the, the fundamental aspect of the difference between truth and falsity. And uh, he's, not, he's not relying on um, cognitive science there. And the, the, um, the kind of thing that he's saying is something that's more naturally articulated as you know, a quasi-logical theory of truth. And that, that, can, be, um, that can be done. Um, but you know, typically, cognitive science is uh, applies logic rather than produces uh, logic uh, it, itself. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I, I think if we if we try to get a, a theory of truth from cognitive science, we'd be liable to a- end up w- with some kind of epistemic theory of truth, some theory about um, what we recognize as, as true rather than just what is true. And um, I mean, I, the, um, the limitations of epistemic theories of truth have been, have been very thoroughly explored over the last 50 uh, years. And, um, and I think the um, kind of arguments that have been produced there make it it's pretty clear um, that, that truth is it is not an epistemic matter. It, it's much closer to being a logical uh, one. Um, then on the second question, which was whether some aspects of the mind uh, defy a scientific uh, approach. Um, I mean, I I agree with you, Fong, that 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 phenomenal characters are, are really not an uh, important thing that I- I- if somehow they were, they were left over by a scientific approach, that would really not be um, a very big 
gap. I mean, my, my own assumption is that in the long run, uh, probably uh, cognitive science can give and psychology can give uh, uh, some kind of account of what we call phenomenal uh, characters so, and so, so that it's not going to be a gap. I mean, that particular thing is not going to be a gap in, in what a, a naturalistic science can can do. Um, so I, I don't want to um, to rest anything uh, on that kind of uh, example. Um, but I, I think the kind of aspect of mind that the cognitive science and other natural sciences might not be in the best investigation to a bit best position to investigate are, are issues like um, the necessary conditions uh, for being uh, a mind. Um, because the range of possible minds, of course, is much wider than just human minds and maybe much wider than just the, all the minds there are on Earth. I mean, of course, we get a bit more generality by thinking of artificial intelligence, but um, but I, I think the, the, the cognitive cognitive science is typically much more interested in questions about what's um, distinctive about the particular kind of mind that that it's dealing with, <coughs> rather than concerned with these more general questions about what it takes to have a mind in the first place. So I think there are, as were some very general. Um, questions about mind like that, which are, are not best dealt with by um, uh, natural science or in particular by co cognitive science. And I, I would say the same about epistemology. I mean, Quine, sure, I mean, Quine put forward this program of um, naturalized uh, epistemology but but he didn't really have much uh, success with it i mean his own of course his own particular uh, approach was uh, a very sort of crudely uh, internalist uh, one but um you know i think a lot of the a lot of the questions in in epistemology are again at a somewhat more um abstract uh Level. I mean, so for example, you know, w w one issue that I've been interested in is um, is the relation between evidence and knowledge, or and the questions ab about whether if you know, you know that you know, and uh, and again, these seem like quasi logical uh, questions, not purely logical, but but they they have a more of a logical character. And uh, although I think we can we can answer these questions in a scientific way, I don't think it will be a, a very um, much of a natural scientific uh, way. I think the um, uh, we have to remember that that some questions, you know, get um, get answered um, by. Uh, by mathematical reasoning, and then and then philosophy is something which which has some features in common with with natural science, but some features in common with with mathematics in particular on, on its reliance on thinking much more than on experimentation. And um, and so I you know I, I think that although the appropriate approach to, to the, the, all these questions is a scientific one. I don't think it will be a natural scientific one. And then I think your third question was really a variant, as you said, on the second question was about um, whether I I introspection um, is is the kind of the, the, the only alternative to uh, a, a scientific study. And, and as I say, I think Again, my answer is is the same. That if by scientific you mean natural natural scientific, then um, then the kind of um, alternative to what we learn by natural scientific investigation that I would propose is not introspection at all, but but is something like the the kind of reasoning that we use um, in in mathematics. But if if we're using science in a more general um, sense to include <coughs> mathematics as well as natural 
uh, science, and and I would argue to include philosophy as well, then I think all of these things uh, can be uh, answered uh, scientifically, and there's there's nothing uh, left over um, like that. And and now to to go on to the questions that that um, May Jahua was uh, asking me. Um, so, so the f the first question was, uh, as it were, to do with the map of these kind of interdisciplinary uh, relations, and um, and I th and so uh, for the reasons that I explained, I, th I think it's they're, they're, it's quite they're quite complicated, and there isn't there isn't just a a sort of one single pattern that, that covers all of these uh, cases. I think maybe my, uh, if I go on to the second and third uh, questions, that, that will make my uh, attitude uh, clearer. So, um, so the, the second question was about um, what cognitive science might be able to uh, contribute to metaphysics, um, and and I agree that something like if we if what we're interested in um, is the for example the psych the psychology of time the or uh, or we might say the phenomenology of time how how we experience uh, time um, I, I agree that for for that purpose um, we. We don't need to to worry about special relativity, um, but I, I take it that the metaphysical question is, is not how do we experience time, but what is time, um, and of course it might be that that question then has to be replaced, given special relativity, by something more like what is space time. Um, so I think that what, what cognitive science can tell us about mainly here is about what we might call folk metaphysics. I mean, that's to say the, um, the kind of view of the world in its, you know, at its most general, um, that, that we're... Um, Psychologically, you know, as we're, if you like, programmed to to take in in its uh, as a kind of framework for thinking about it, and um, I, and I I certainly agree that um, cognitive science can tell us about that. And, and by the way, a, a, a philosopher, a metaphysician who's interested in this aspect of cognitive uh, science is my my colleague at uh, Yale. When I visit there. He, every year except when there's COVID-19 um Laurie Paul who's who's interested in those uh questions but you know but I think um fundamentally what what that sort of uh, pursuit is um designed to to understand is how we how we are programmed to think of the nature of the world but metaphysics itself is to do with what the nature of the world really is and um of course it, it's not that the cognitive science aspect is completely irrelevant because as it were it it may give us a greater self understanding and and so and so makes us aware of what kind of Metaphysics. We're bringing to questions of metaphysics. For, for example, when we um, when we assess particular examples, you know whether there are kind, of, you know whether such and such an example is a plausible case or whatever. Uh, it may well be that that we need to know what kind of folk metaphysics we're using in assessing those uh, examples. Um, but um, but fundamentally. Um, 
those it's those that's just a preliminary to asking the the questions about as well what the world is really like and i take it that the those questions of metaphysics are somewhat more like um the questions of physics uh than the question than questions of cognitive uh science um so that just as there's a distinction between physics and folk physics there's a distinction between metaphysics and uh folk uh metaphysics and so i, I as i say i it seems to me that what cognitive science is giving us is maybe greater self-understanding, which is relevant to uh, approaching metaphysical questions, but doesn't by itself give us the answers to metaphysical uh, questions. Um, and then the the third question was about what psychologists can learn from the uh, the philosophy of mind. So, um, so in the talk, I was giving some examples of that. I, for example, um, Jerry Fodor um, formulating the language of thought and the modularity of mind as uh, some hypotheses at a high level about the nature of mind, and and at a more specific level, um, I think the, the psychology of um, reasoning. Um, which uh, which requires, I mean, the, the psychology of, of reasoning takes over from logic various um, assumptions about what are valid and what are invalid arguments, and and so it's um, it's using a kind of logic at pretty much as a branch of of philosophy um, as an input. Uh, it's it's not that the psychology of reasoning is is independently. Um, giving us our, our logic, but but the questions that you you focused on were were two. One one was um, philosophy for for consciousness uh, research, and the other was uh, what does philosophy of have to offer artificial uh, intelligence. Um, so in the case of consciousness uh, of course this this is an area which is uh is is not very well um understood but um you know philo philosophers have contributed to a variety of distinctions between different kinds of um conscious consciousness you know sort of uh, some of them to do with access and and some of them individuated in other ways and um and so you know i think that where we're contributing something along those uh lines of course um you know it's it's not it's not yet that we've um that these questions have been fully answered so it's not it's not clear who, as well who, who's going to get the credit for a solution that we that we don't yet have but but I think that uh, I mean consciousness is a case is, is an example where um, it's not very clear what it is that we are supposed to be studying um, and and, and if we're lumping to, if, if we're using the term consciousness in, in some kind of ambiguous way or a way that covers very disparate phenomena, then consciousness research is itself going to be in trouble. And I think in the long run, I, I think philosophy has a, quite a lot to contribute just to <coughs> um, demarcating, you know, what what the things are that we need to be uh, understanding uh, here, but of course, I mean that is that is only a a preliminary, and um, and I'm sh I'm sure it that, that it's not that philosophy can solve all these uh, questions uh, by itself. Um, I mean, for for artificial uh, intelligence, um, I th I think the again the. Um, philosophy's 
contribution um, is is at the at the more theoretical uh, end um, because it's. Um, I mean, one, th- one thing we need if we're to study artificial intelligence, of course, we need to have an understanding of um, the nature, the general nature of intelligence. Because uh, if we, um, if we just, as we study intelligence uh, in the form that it takes in human beings and maybe uh, higher uh, animals, um, then 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 we may be conflating intelligence in general with a specific kind of intelligence that um b- biological entities on earth um have and, and and of course with ai what we need to be able to do is to to look at um forms of intelligence which may be quite different from human intelligence or, or uh, candidate forms of intelligence uh, which may, which are quite different from human intelligence and then and then judge w- whether they're intelligent but in some other way from the way that we're uh, familiar with and uh, again I, it's not that i think the philosophy by itself is just going to solve all these problems but i think that the uh, ability uh, to uh, to consider um the question of of the, what necessary, roughly speaking, necessary and sufficient conditions for in, intelligence, at least to think about those issues, um, is uh, you know that's that's the kind of question that philosophers are quite used to uh, dealing with, uh, and w- where the you know the methodology of thought experiments and so on is quite uh, relevant, and um, and it's not really a question. That it would be appropriate to to leave to AI researchers themselves, because I mean, as where they have a vested uh, interest in uh, describing what they've produced as a case of intelligence, um, and um, and so we we need um, t- to have researchers involved I- in assessing you know what the AI researchers have come up with, who have less of a vested interest in in giving a positive answer to the question of is this intelligence, and uh, it seems to me that that um, ph- philosophers are actually um, better placed than the natural alternatives uh, to to answer that question in a comparatively unbiased way. I'm not I'm not suggesting that we'd be philosophers would be totally unbiased, but at least we don't have a vested interest in one answer over the other. Um, so again, as I, I haven't I haven't answered all the, the considerations that, that were brought up, but but that's a, a first shot at, at my response to those questions. And thanks very much for asking me. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, this time, I want to take my chair's advantage to ask a question. Uh, yeah. You talk a lot about close relationship between philosophy and psychology. Uh, I'm wondering, what's your comments on psycho- uh, psychologism and anti-psychologism by Frege Husserl in the beginning of last century in philosophy, logic, and mathematics? Uh, maybe you can give us some short comments. This is a big yes. question. Yeah, okay. So, so basically, I'm very sympathetic to Frege and and Husserl, um, and um, and I think that um, it, it's it is a very bad mistake uh, to confuse questions in logic or mathematics with questions uh, in psychology. Um, and so the fact that there's a um a close a close relation between philosophy and psychology that we we've, we've got something to teach them and they've got something to teach us i mean that's that's relevant uh for example to um to understanding the nature of uh human thinking about mathematics and logic but it but that doesn't mean that um that the 
psychologism, you know, should be allowed, um, you know, to that we should take a psychologistic view of what the subject matter of um, mathematics and logic uh, is. Um, and, and in fact, it, e even, in, um, even in epistemology, I, I, I'm anti-psychologistic uh, in the sense that I think many um, accounts of um, evidence, the evidence that we have for or against hypotheses or theories, many accounts of evidence in uh, epistemology are they're psychologistic in a bad uh, way that they they just try to to uh, assimilate our uh, evidence to to certain psychological states, and I, I think that's that is also a, a, an example of the fi fallacy of uh, psychologism. So um, so although there is a close relation between philosophy and psychology, um, I think. Uh, anti-psychologism is is still uh, a fallacy and uh, and fundamentally Frager and Husserl will write about that.